Kia ora koutou. hello everybody and welcome to Epic Aotearoa Create a Better Future podcast where every week we share uplifting messages told by New Zealanders in their own words. Our mission is to share the learnings from those lived experiences, inspire our listeners to take positive action and go out there and create a better future. Proudly brought to you by co-founders Joe Hortai, former soldier in the Special Air Service, family man and aspiring entrepreneur, and Brian Osman, a knowledge engineer, family man, entrepreneur and all-round good dude. Thank you for connecting with us today. Now let's get started and create a better future. Let's go. Tēnā koutou welcome to uh, a new episode of Epic Aotearoa, Create a Better Future, and in today's interview, meeting, discussion, conversation, I have the privilege of meeting with Stuart Campbell, and Stuart Campbell is a martial artist, but not like you might know it. Right. He's got a story to tell, and this story is really, really fascinating because not only does it, does it encompass the things that we love to see as kids, so you know, Kung Fu movies and, and, and Bruce Lee and all those things that you might associate with martial arts. But we're really talking about a serious martial artist who is on a bit of a, a mission to inform the world about his particular branch, approach, style, philosophy, art of martial art. And particularly, which I find exciting, is it from a, a Kiwi slant. So without further ado, welcome, Stuart. Welcome to the show. Right. Thanks for yeah, having no, me. no worries. It's great to, um, to have you on board and, and to be able to hear your story. So I think we'll just jump straight in because we've had a bit of banter beforehand before the conversation started off. And I was going, oh, no, I, I kicked myself for not pushing record already because he shared some really insightful things and some just nuggets of gold, I thought. But let's start with you, perhaps, if you can share your background so that our, our listeners can can connect with this martial arts lifestyle that you've that you've just captured and run with mm -hmm. okay well um initially i grew up in mm. wairu um obviously military base um I, my father wasn't in the army uh but um i sort of obviously went to school with all the army <laughs> army brats and as i said to you you know I, I wasn't an army brat but i was probably a brat <laughs> um bit of a bad influence on some of my peers um for whatever reasons um, but my father was actually in the GCSB, so he was a he was a spy, um, which we didn't find out till later on. But anyway, we were based in Waiuru. Um, we actually went from mm. Waiuru to Singapore, um, 1967 to 70. Um, he was involved uh, with other what became the Five Eyes Network over there, and um, they were basically monitoring all of the radio communications uh, from Singapore. Uh, of Southeast Asia, uh, specifically mm. during the Vietnam War. So we spent um, three years in Singapore, came back in 1970. Um, you know, started school in Singapore, but then came back and continued my schooling in Wairu. So a bit of a contrast there going from red hot or freezing cold Wairu, snowing <laughs> to red hot Singapore, to freezing cold Wairu. You know, I'm sure any army brat who's done that would um, would still have a few twitches from that or something. Or I don't know. It must have been somewhere. Um, and then... Mm. 1975, um, and I was born in 64, so I was 10 years old just before my 10th birthday. Um, I had three older brothers, and a couple of them come home one night, and they said, um, hey, we've just seen this really cool martial arts thing. You should go along. And um, at the time, I was very scrawny, very short. Well, not very short, mm. but, you know, shorter than most people. And um, I had a lisp. So they sort of looked at me as like, you know, we're really cool and strong and tough, and here's this little wimpy uh, kid over here and he really needs some you know needs some exercise and some muscles so <clears throat> they convinced me to go along to this taekwondo class and there was quite a few people coming back from singapore who'd done taekwondo and other martial arts over in singapore and they were mm. coming back and being based in wairu so we were sort of this class was originally um if i name names um john tidier um he came back and he started a couple of classes um with his brother padre tyria who was um been a Vietnam Victor company. Um, anyway, he was also came back from Singapore and he started his in New Lynn, or Grey Lynn up in Auckland at the same time. So we had a little bit of a federation going there. 
And so um, I pretty much um, did Taekwondo for um, 10 years mm. um, from 75 until mm. 84. And um, during that time, I, um, I got my gradings. I, I graded to first degree black belt when I was 14. Um, so one of the youngest in the South Pacific at that stage, and they, they didn't know whether to call me senior or junior or whatever. Um, then I sort of had a little bit of a break while I moved towns, um, went down sort of around the Martin okay. Rangitiki area and um, walked into a dojo after not training for a couple of years. The instructor recognized me and he just said, oh, it's your class. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So started teaching there. Um, by that stage, I'd done another grade. I, at 17, I, I went for my second degree, um, Black Bell. And so sort of started rekindling my, my passion for martial mm. arts there. Um, and then I, I met, um, oh, sorry, what was also going on at that stage was I'd become aware of ninjutsu, which is the martial arts that um, at the time was just called uh, Togakureru ninjutsu. And funnily enough, the story, the way I came about it was I went to Wellington with um, one of my people who was training with me in Wairu, and I went into the martial arts mm, store, as you do yes. with a martial artist, and yes. you know, it's like Wonderland. And I sort of went in there, and, and I, I picked up this book, and it's Ninjutsu History and Tradition by Masaki Hatsumi, uh, 34th Soke of Togakureru Ninjutsu. Anyway, I, I sort of picked it up and I, I was reading through it. And I was like, oh, wow, ninjas. Um, nah, can't be. Um, and I, I, I was so intrigued by it, I actually bought it, thinking that this must be what they used to make ninja movies. You know, it's got all these guys with black masks and firing mortars and they're doing all sorts of stuff. And it's like, wow, you know, that's that's sort of something I'd like to play with um, because, you know, doing Taekwondo, it's very conventional, very rigid, very regimented, mm. which is good, good for a young guy like me to keep me on track. Um, but I always sort of kept that in the back of my mind. So just moving forward again in the story where I'd had my second degree, I was in Martin, I'd gone to an event where um, the Grand Master was, um, he'd come over from Brisbane and uh, I'd seen a couple of news uh, articles in Black Belt magazine that said, you know, uh, a guy named Wayne Roy in Brisbane is teaching ninjutsu. He's been to Japan, been there for nine months, graded to second degree, come back, and he set up some dojos, and one of them was in Brisbane. So sort of in the back of my mind, when um, I heard this master say he was looking for someone to go and work and run his, dojo, his gym in um, Brisbane, <laughs> sort of Brisbane, Brisbane, <laughs> ninjas, Brisbane, you know, they sort of cropped up, and it's like, hmm. I'd like to go to Brisbane. Um, I, didn't sort of, I, I made a few jokes. We used to play around. In fact, um, mm. I joked with my brother. He he worked down in the army camp when I was in Moiru, and uh, he printed us up a couple of fake certificates from the Fukushingi <laughs> School of Ninjutsu. And we used to have those on our mantelpiece yeah. where we flattered together, and people would come in, you know, and they go, hey, what's this? Are you guys ninjas? And say, yeah. yeah. Said, you know, we're just pulling their, pulling their chain, you know. And so it's funny how prophetically, you know, you're talking about pretending to be a ninja and then later on you actually learn the arts and so on, so on. But um, anyway, so I went to Brisbane and um, I, I worked for this Korean grandmaster. And to be honest, I started to see the commercial side mm. of, of martial arts. He had a big gym in uh, mm. Collingwood Street in Albion. Um, he had a lot of uh, students and a lot of schools scattered around um, not only Brisbane, the South Pacific still. Uh, that was the South Pacific Taekwondo Academy. And um, I just started to see things that, that sort of like, you know, his wife was worrying about money for their new house and and uh, some of the things that happened. And I won't go into too much detail. I don't want to drop a minute, but um, it was obviously more about the money. And um, even saying to me, uh, you know, if anyone rings up and wants to do a class, tell them that I run every class and everything, which I knew was well, not true because I was running his classes for him and other, some of the other black belts. And so I was like, hang on a second, I, I, I can't lie to people and say that you're going to run every class mm. when you're not actually doing this. So anyway, um, I, I sort of got a little bit disillusioned. We ran a, or he ran a black belt mm. uh, workshop. Um, this, is, this is now in 1985. Um, and a few of my old colleagues, Padre Tidia and a few other people came over from New Zealand and we, we, caught up with each other and we did this workshop and anyway it was quite funny there was a guy in there who'd come from Vietnam his name was Van Man Nguyen and um, he was a third degree black belt he was a fourth degree and, and he got demoted uh, for whatever commercial reason 
Anyway, um, we were doing the seminar and, and, and Man had been through like the killing fields and to get out of, um, as it was Vietnam, you know, with all the Pol Pot and all that sort of stuff and um, made his way to Malaysia and been in a, a camp there and he'd seen people dying on the refugee boats and everything. So mm. he knew reality, you know, he was pretty real about things. Anyway, um, we're doing this workshop and he and this master's showing us these wrist locks and stuff and he's just grabbing the wrist and going, yeah, here you go. And Man's going, we, we taught him a bit, a little bit of English. He wasn't very good at English, but one of the things we taught him was the word bullshit. And anyway, he said, you just grab it and twist it and they fall down. And Mark's going, no, 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 this, this bullshit, bullshit. You hit first, you hit first, then you can do, but you can't do. You know, and he was like this, you know, and he's pretty remissive of, of some of the techniques that were going on. Anyway, um, mm. interestingly, I, I was sitting there down there one day in the dojo, uh, sorry, in, in the um, gym area and Man came down because he used to live upstairs with us. And he said, you want to have a spa? And it's mm. like, oh, not spa, mm. pool, just free spa. And I uh, said, oh, yeah, why not? And anyway, we went into the, the training area and he bit the really? crap out of me. Yeah. You know, I managed to hold my own, but he was really trying to hit me and kick me and, you know, and he was just really hard on it. And it's like, whoa. And I said to Man afterwards, I said, Man, why, why do you fight like that? Why do you fight so hard? He says, because when I fight you, you're my enemy. Mm. And I, this is a... You know, mm. I'd been shadow boxing in Taekwondo. I'd been to tournaments and, and actually got my ass whipped a few times. But um, I thought I was pretty good. The ego sort of come out and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm second done. I was about to go for my third done. And um, he sort of gave me a bit of reality check. And then when at, at the seminar, when he'd sort of said, you know, this is not right and I knew where he was coming from, I um, it got me thinking, you know, it's like mm, money. A lot of money coming in here, not enough money, all sorts of things going on here. And then, you know, this reality check from someone who's been at the forefront of reality, you know, the killing fields and what have you. And um, funny enough, he was going for his third down or fourth down or something at a grading. Anyway, I'd sussed him out by then. And when we actually, um, <laughs> I had to spar him and um, <laughs> I kept him at bay and kept hitting him in the chest and kicking him and all this sort of thing. And, and he was really getting demoralized. And at the end of it, he says, Stuart. <laughs> Why you hit me so hard? I said, because I fight with you, man. You're my enemy. <laughs> you turned it around on him. <laughs> so yeah, just yeah, he sort of had yeah. to suck it up, Buttercup, you know. And and um, but but it, he would probably was mm. a bit of a catalyst for me, as, as you know. Um, I'd I'd sort of um, been sort of not treated very nicely from this master, who I thought, you know, mm. master. He he. He called himself a master. Um, that um, he should be a master of his own mm. sort of environment, sure, not just a master of business. So that sort of disillusioned me as well. I saw it from the inside out. So anyway, um, I thought I'm going to I'm going to look up this Wayne Roy guy mm. down in Cooper's Plains. So by that stage, I'd I'd given up working for Master Yun, and I was working part time doing something else. Now when I was in Wairu, um, I was actually qualified okay. as a butcher. Yep. So I was. <clears throat> working as a butcher and working with these crazy guys uh, out at um, Spencer's Mints in Milton. And anyway, um, I um, saw, I, I rang this guy, Wayne Roy, and picked up the phone and it's like, okay. And I had this coin, it was a coin operated thing. And I, I had a few coins, you know, and I'm <laughs> putting them in and talking away. And we got really talking and it's like, <laughs> yeah. ding. I was like, oh. Hey Wayne, I'd love to talk more, but I'm running out of out of money, you know. Anyway, he said, "Oh, oh well, what are you doing today?" And I said, "Oh, not much. I'm talking to you, but you know, I've got the day off, sort of thing." He said, "Why don't you come down and see us?" And I said, "Oh, oh yeah, okay." I was a bit nervous because I'd mm. never met a ninja before, you know. And it's like this guy was a ninja, and it's like, I, yeah. Um, so anyway, got on the train, went down to Cooper's Plains. Got off on his directions. I sort of walked through this marshy area in, in this industrial area, but there was nothing else around. It was sort of like something out. I don't know whether you ever oh, saw yes. the movie The Octagon yeah. with Shoko Chuck Norris, and, yes. and Chuck Norris. It was sort of like that. It was sort of like it didn't have the octagon, but it was like an open area here, and there was a couple of rampart um, sort of boards here and a bit over here and a swing up here. And, and I'm sort of like, oh, man, this is pretty freaky. This must be like a ninja camp, you know? And... Uh, Anyway, I was sort of tentatively walked in there and um, I went to these front um, doors and I, and I sort of knocked and it's like, tick, tick, tick. it's like, tick, tick, tick. then I hear this, ah, oh, Mr. Campbell. 
without a word of a lie, <laughs> I thought he was on the roof. I thought he, this ninja was playing a, playing a joke on me. And I'm looking up on the roof here going, where, the, where is he? And there was a lattice down the side of the building. And he'd actually just walk out the side door and come around the side and was talking through the lattice at me. But this is my perception, you see, of a ninja. I was like, I didn't know. And so anyway, we, we um, I sat down with him. We had some tea and we started talking about um, our martial arts experiences. He'd done other martial arts. His father was a martial artist as well. Um, and he'd done sort of some Kung Fu. I think he'd done some Taekwondo and a bit of karate mm. and that, but he'd gone to Japan, as I said. So anyway, we, we talked for a few hours and he said, look, I'm, I'm running a introductory class uh, in a couple of weeks time. Do you want to come along? He said, it's, it's one night a week for four weeks. I thought, oh yeah, that's a bit of me. So um, anyway, I, I liked what he said uh, when we were just having our discussions. You know, he would say things like, um, Imagine if you could, um, if you're in a fight situation and the guy went to pick up a bottle and you had it in your hand before he grabbed it. Or imagine if he was going to slap you around the head with a chair and you had your foot on the chair before you even picked it up. <laughs> what? How does this work? It's like, you know, this is pretty mystical sort of stuff. And anyway, that sort of captivated me. So anyway, um, myself and, an, and another friend of mine who um, I'd met at the outset of going to Brisbane, Michael Lamb, we decided we go down to this. He'd done Taekwondo as well. So we decided to do this four-week introductory class. And I must admit, probably in about the second week, I learned more about martial arts in two mm -hmm. weeks, two sessions, than wow. I did in 10 years of Taekwondo. Wow. So people used to say to me, oh, you do martial arts. And I'd go, yeah. And they'd say, oh, that's all about the mind, isn't it? And i go, oh, yeah, sort of. But I, I didn't. Mm. understand the correlation between the body and the mind and the spirit you see and but i would just say oh yeah and um but i didn't really understand it i didn't know how it was affecting me mentally i, I knew you know as i say i was a little bit of a brat and i knew that my martial arts had sort of kept me a little bit on the straight and narrow and kept me out of sort of any major sort of trouble the thing was and, and this is no excuse but just going back to why i'd left school at the end of the fourth form just turned 15 started my apprenticeship all my mates were still at school for the next couple of years. So I started hanging around with an old group of people who were my brothers and his mates who were in sort of 18, 19 year olds. So, you know, they were doing things that a 15 year old sort of mm. you know, wouldn't mm. necessarily be involved in that sort of time parties and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, but, but saying that I'd still have to get up on a Sunday morning and go to training and, you know, so I had this sort of balance there and that sort of kept me on the straight and narrow. So, um, so I started, um, I, I actually decided to go to live in Sydney um, after this introduction class because there was not much work around. My brother lived in Sydney, so it was easy for us to go and uh, stay down there. My, my wife, who's my wife now, she was my girlfriend. She had come over and we were both living in, in Brisbane at the time and we thought it was better mm. we go to, to Sydney. So we went down there and um, started training down there. And so... I got the introduction from sort of Wayne Roy to the dojo down there at the time. And you'll really like this coming from Sydney because mm. it's such a beautiful harbour. When we first started training, um, we were training over in North Sydney at Ball's Head Reserve, opposite the uh, Harbour Bridge with oh, the, yes. in the background yeah, yeah, of the yeah, Opera yeah. House underneath that. And so we were training in a sort of grassy area at night, floodlit, doing what we were doing at that stage. We, it was called Tugakureru Ninjutsu. And it was just what a what an amazing backdrop. We were training outside in the elements. Yeah. It rained. We didn't care. You know, if it was hot or muggy, it didn't matter. Um, so we that's where I sort of started there. Um, and then uh, we sort of spent a little bit of time in a church out at Artaman. Um, got a little church dojo there. And then eventually we set up the, as I was talking to you before about in Surrey Hills, um, on the fifth floor of this industrial building. We, it was industrial because it was a sewing place and we spent hours and hours going through each of the rungs on the floor and actually pulling out needles and more and more needles, <laughs> buckets of needles, sewing machine needles out of everything. And I think we didn't get them all because a couple of people got them in their foot. So yeah, so we, we sort of founded the, the Surrey Hills mm. Dojo at that stage and that was still under Wayne Roy. He'd sent a black belt down to um, to sort of do that school there. Um, I, I trained with them for... Um, couple of years what was amazing about that period was it was new to new zealand oh sorry new to australia mm. wasn't in new zealand at that stage um 
and um, there were people coming to that art who were wouldn't say masters some of them were but or at least instructors in other martial arts they'd had a lot of martial arts background you had guys from um mm. from wing chun from taekwondo mm. from karate from and that was a very high level of martial expertise there but there was also um one of the things that i did in its introductory class is there was a class running in parallel which was the spiritual aspects of martial arts which was called the esoteric school of martial arts not run by wayne roy but one by, run by another guy named bill cook edwards and that went into things like um, how the elements work, you know, earthy, water, fire, and, and the void, and how you could tie those in with the martial arts. Uh, things like sensing about um, how you could train yourself using um, psychometry to actually tap into people's vibrations and, and you know, predict how they're feeling, but, you know, how things are going to shape up and how things are going. I was sort of a bit, CIA might call it remote sensing because you could sort of project out. And there was all that sort of thing, at, you know, meditation and all that. And, what was amazing about the dojo in Sydney was we were all doing this stuff and there was a very high spiritual level as mm. well as a physical level. I mean, looking at it now, I, I, I looked at those black belts and I, I was looking at it from a third degree Taekwondo perspective. So I'd, I'd been doing martial arts. I knew a little bit about martial arts. And these guys would have would have given a six dan and karate a run for their money. You know, the, these ninjas, these guys I was training with my teachers and the black belts and some, some of the higher grades. Um, so it was a very high level of, of skill, although saying that, not a lot of information was coming out of Japan at that stage. It was still talking sort of 1986, 87. So um, not a lot of people were going to Japan. This is back in mm. the Stephen K. Hayes days when he took it over to America, to Beaumont, to Sweden, um, Doron Navon from uh, Israel. All those guys were sort of gone to Japan, lived in Japan, come back, and then were starting to set up schools. Wayne Roy was sort of only there for the nine months. He was going backwards and forwards. Um, but the other thing that was interesting was, from a spiritual aspect, was you might be thinking about something, and one of these senior students, one of the black belts, or even the, the, the first cues, he'd come up to you and start talking to you about it. <laughs> like, I, I remember I, I we went to the harbour one time, and, and I was down there, and I was, for some reason, I was thinking about... You know how you, mm. when you train a martial arts for a long time and your black belt goes goes to mm. white as if you've gone full circle? And for some reason, I was thinking about, you know, how you could expedite that by sort of wetting your belt and hitting it on the rocks. And I something had come to me about that. Anyway, I happened to go to class one night and one of the senior students come up to me and he goes, oh, I see your belt's pretty clean. He said, you know, you want to go out and hit that on the rocks and it might make it a bit less pristine. <laughs> Stuff like that was just coming so out of what? the blue. I was like... <laughs> And that's that's yeah. how connected, yeah. That's how mm. connected everything was, you know. So um, there was a lot going on in that dojo. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I only stayed at that mm. dojo for two years. Um, but in that time, uh, I was only a six Q. I'd only been doing it for a few months, or probably I, I, I went up through the ranks really quickly. I just had an aptitude for it, or um, I don't know. But I had to sort of also at the same time I had to leave my kicks behind from TKD, and also. Um, my stances and postures and mm. some of my rigidity, you know, uh, because I, I think of it like this. If, if you're doing martial arts, traditional martial arts, or, or how would you say, like, like Taekwondo, like Karate, they're very rigid. And, you know, like uh, you're doing a, a guarding block and this has to be at eye level. This has to be at 12 and a half degrees. The thumb has to be tucked in slightly. This hand has to be at solar plexus. You know, everything mm. is very square. Taijutsu, on the other hand, or, or, or is it... Um, Togakure Ru Ninjutsu as it later became uh, Bushinkan Kobudo Taijutsu I'll talk about that it's like you start as a square and then instead of moving laterally forwards and backwards and to the sides as you would in your kata you do the odd sort of diagonals um, you, you started moving in circles like we are talking about before and you'd think of it like an asterisk where you'd actually step off the asterisk here and then you'd have another circle in the circle you could step this way and step this way and step this way and at first, that was very foreign to me. In fact, when I was doing Taekwondo, Padre, my instructor, would say, just step off line, step off the line. And I couldn't do it because I was so used to laterally mm. moving forwards and backwards. I'm like, I can't move that way. But when we started doing this, you started cutting yeah. the corners off the square. Yeah. So it started becoming a, you know, an octagon and then a, and eventually you became full circle and you, you, you were able to move as a ball more so than a cube in any direction. So you weren't limited to this square box that you've been conditioned to. So it's sort of an analogy for, I suppose, the differences between that.
And I think in a way, it's good that you had that mm. square grounding first before you actually went and do the art, would, um, when go and do the art, because you understand that form. Now, the reason I say that is because people were going to Japan a lot more later on. The problem is that these people who hadn't done that, that square disciplined martial arts would walk into a dojo in Japan or the Hombu Dojo, which is the headquarters in, in um, Noda. And um, the Japanese sort of seem pretty laid back and, you know, which is really not Jap Jap Japanese. You know, it's a very rigid um, structure, a very like from the feudal system, you know, you hand over your business card this way, you know, you, you say certain things and to certain people in a certain greeting, you know, and, and all this sort of thing. So they live in a very disciplined society, which is your square over here that you would get in the grounding of a normal martial art. But for them, it was, it was, they had that in their background, whereas the Kiwi or, you know, or anyone Western would go over there and go, oh, this is the way we need to train. We just won't worry about all this square stuff. We won't worry about, you know, how we do um, our postures properly with this here and all that here. We'll just sort of slap dab like the Japanese do. And so some of the people who came back from that who hadn't had that grounding, we got mm. some very sloppy, no foundations sort of to the, to the art out of that. So... Um, just sort of pick, picking up on a few things along the way here. So um, from there, I, I didn't train for a couple of years um, in, in a dojo. I was doing Tai Chi and a bit of Kung Fu and that sort of thing. Um, and then I, I, at that stage, I was quite busy. I was working long hours. I was doing a building diploma in, in construction. And so I didn't get a chance to go to much training, but I, I by chance, happened to be walking around a building site that we were on that in North Sydney that had closed um, mm -hmm. off the North Sydney mm -hmm. station. It was called Metro Plaza. And at the time, there was a lot of industrial problems. And anyway, we, we had a whole group of security guards on there looking after our security because we'd locked all the people out for about six weeks, all the workers, because we got sick of all this industrial action. And I see this guy over in the corner and he's sort of Asian guy and he's, you know, and he's doing these moves and oh, he's a bit of martial arts. So I go over and start talking to him because the, the site was closed, so I didn't have much to do. And um, I said, oh, you do martial arts? He said, oh, yeah, a little bit, very humbly. I said, oh, what do you do? And he said, uh, I do um, uh, Bakwa. Mm. Well, I'd never heard of Bakwa. Um, Bakwa. Anyway, I said, oh, he said, do you do martial arts? I said, oh, I sort of do, yeah. And he said, um, do you want to do some training? And I said, oh, oh, yeah. You know, because I was training with other people at the time, and, and he came around to my place. We were living down at Caring Bar in those days. And um, he was telling me how to strengthen his forearms. He said, do this in the morning and focus on this, and very strong in building chi, and, and you know, really strong in, on his forearms and stuff, even though he's a scrawny little guy. Mm. Reminded me of Bruce Lee. Didn't look like Bruce Lee, but the sort of the demeanor of Bruce Lee. So he starts demonstrating some of the stuff he's doing, and he's, like, doing stuff like he's, he's – this far away from me and he's doing kicks up to the side of my head just really slowly and <laughs> holding the mirror and all this sort of thing and it's like wow this guy he, he would have been 30 yeah. 32 34 and um anyway he, i was amazed at that he, and he said um oh i said well how did you learn this art and he said well actually my grandfather taught me he said but he didn't really teach me the art what he did was um just he'd have me standing in a horse stance for hours as a kid and if, if i Got out of the horse stance, he'd come and tell me, tell me off. And he said, and I didn't realize until one day I was on a on a um, ferry in Malaysia, going across a very rough piece of water, and everyone else is going like this, you know, from side to side. And he said, and I'm just standing there. <laughs> yeah. He had the balance, you see. Anyway, it was funny. He um he was talking about the one inch mm. punch, and he said, oh yeah, Bruce Lee <clears> does <throat> the one inch punch. He said, you know, you, you channel your chi into here and what have you. And he said, um, just like this. And he just went, yep. and he hit me in the sternum, and my whole skeleton shook. It's like, whoa! I'd never been hit like that. I felt it in my everywhere in my body, and it's like, whoa! And he says, oh yeah, yeah. And then he says, yeah, just just here. Yeah. And he hits me again, and I I thought, shit! I hope he doesn't hit me one more time because my whole skeleton is going to shatter. And he, I just never experienced hmm. that sort of power, you know. So. Anyway, that, that was an interesting uh, person I met along the journey. Mm. We didn't do much more training. Maybe I was scared. I don't know. Um, but um, to cut that long story short of being in Sydney, 
I got made redundant from the building industry and we came back to New Zealand um, on a surprise holiday for the family and the mm. family was mostly in Martin. And while we were here, I went and checked out these guys who were training in, in um, they were Palmerston North and what was going on. And I'm sort of, you know, keeping in mind I hadn't trained for six, seven years and I'm looking at these guys and I'm going, that's not the art that I used to do. It was, it was apart from mm. one person who stood out, who's still doing it, it's like, Oh, a few people actually, probably two or three. I was like, well, what the hell is this? You know, they were playing ninja and all this mm. sort of thing, but they weren't really, really doing well. And, and not, they couldn't have took, taken on a, a black belt, wouldn't have taken on even a, a green belt in another martial arts sort of thing. I know I'm being a bit harsh on anyone who might tune into this, but, you know, you had to understand what I had gone through. I mean, when we were training in Sydney, you would train and we would do semi to, to not quite full contact. You'd go home feeling like mm. you'd been hit by a train, you know, or a truck. Mm. You'd get up the next morning and it's like, oh. And we used to get other martial artists come along and they'd think, oh, yeah, I can do this. They'd yeah. never come back. Yeah. Some of them never came back because they'd never been hit. So when I saw these guys training, it's like, what's going on here? This is weird. So anyway, mm. went back to Sydney with my wife and kids and, and did a bit of a pros and cons exercise and said, we had a house in Martin we bought while we were overseas. I said, why don't we... um why don't we go back to New Zealand? There's not many jobs at that stage, but so, oh, well, we'll find something. So we go back to New Zealand. But before we went, I went and saw one of my old instructors who lived in North up in Gosford and uh, Michael Totoli. And I said, we talked for a while and I said, look, I want to go back to New Zealand and, and teach martial arts, teach this, these arts, but I need some credentials. At that stage, I was only a third queue. I hadn't got to black belt. I'd left before then. And he said, look, after everything we've been discussing, he said, i got no problem. I'll grade you to second dan. So he graded me to second dan. So anyway, I went back to New Zealand and um, I was just going to set up a dojo in Martin and just do my own thing sort of thing. But I thought I, I better be courteous and talk to the head guy who was in Auckland, as Michael Gent. And um, he had, at that stage, I think he'd been to Japan, but he was a, oh, what was he? Mm -hmm. He was a fifth dan at the time. And I was only a second down, you see. And anyway, I, out of courtesy, I happened to be in Auckland, so I went down to his dojo and we started talking. And um, he said, oh, thanks for coming and seeing us, you know, if you ever want to train and that sort of thing. A few days later, I get a phone call from him. He said, you're at Martin. He said, yeah. He said, um, listen, I, I've got a bit of a mess I need to sort out down in Wellington. You know, And they, these were some of the guys that I'd seen. He said, would you mind going down there and actually taking over those schools? And I thought, oh. He said, you know, you, you get paid out of the, it's sort of like a full-time job sort of thing. I said, oh, yeah, okay, that'd be, that'd be fun. So um, there were nine schools down there, all the way from Foxton, Palmerston North, a um, few in Wellington, uh, Masterton, that sort of thing, Upper Hutt. So anyway, I um, said, yeah, fine, you know. And so he introduced me and, and we went down there and I started taking black belt classes. And um, the standard was very very low there were black belts who'd only been oh, training wow. 18 months yeah not even 20 years mm. old no life experience didn't even know all the kamai all the all the postures and um here they are running these classes to trying to teach these adults so effectively i went through implementing what i knew from the art the real side of it and um or what i saw was the real side and a lot of these people just left but in the interim we decided to set up a, a dojo in Petoni, and they were it was an opening and it was big expense. Just this guy, the landlord basically kitted it out for us, you know, sanded all the floors and lacquered them and all sorts of things. Beautiful place. And anyway, no one came basically. We ended up with two students here on, wow. on a black belt class night. So mm. We couldn't sustain it. So that went from probably 150, which we thought was a good business model to actually sustain that to uh, a lot of the schools just dissolved because they couldn't handle the 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 real stuff I was giving them through the black belt classes, and I, I was probably had a few mm. nicknames to them, you know, <laughs> which I won't repeat on. That's here. actually that's actually really fascinating because uh, I'm I'm trying to re I'm reflecting back to that kind of that time, right? And um and as we talked offline, you know, did a little bit of uh, I'd say I dabbled a little bit in martial arts as a young as a young fella, and um. But one of the things that I would do, and like yourself, um, the martial arts shop in Wellington, now I think that was on, is it Willis Street, Dixon Street, somewhere, uh, Cuba Mall. Cuba Mall. Cuba Mall, somewhere, somewhere near, near there. Cuba yeah, Mall. that's right. 
And yeah, you're right. It was just like that was the the mecca of all things martial arts. Did you, know, you go in? I remember buying um, a couple yep. of books. I remember seeing the book that you that you showed. Um, and I thought, oh man, that's so cool. Because to me at the time, ninjas, ninja, right, was something that was on the Shogun miniseries with Richard Chamberlain, and they all, you know, they all invaded their the outpost, their fort, or whatever it is. Yes, I thought, man, that's so cool. But yeah, what, what I was, what really stood out in my mind with that was that this is something that looks different. So I equate a ninja with assassin or somebody that that um, is undercover. The you know, where's the masks? That, that's that's my sum total world of ninja, ninja. But I do remember recalling the more I read in Black Bat M magazine, I would go into to the bookstores and just read this, you know, and, and, oh. and Kung Fu and, and read those magazines and, and draw for it. And, and one thing that really stood out to me while I was trying to, well, I was still in that martial art phase, I guess, was understand my square right, and work the square. But mm -hmm. there was something drawing me to it. Where's my circle? It, it was drawing me to that. And, and I, but I didn't, I was too young to understand what that meant. So it's really fascinating, mm. fascinating to me that, mm -hmm. that you're talking about this. So why that um, that does resonate is also going back to reality. Right? And and again, I'm, I've seen classes. Uh, I do remember um, a Gong Fu school that I that I went to, and I won't say the name because, uh, to be honest, I, I've really forgotten what it was called properly. And, and you know, we talked about this offline. But I remember being visited. We had, I think the initial introduction session, and other martial artists came. And it's almost like they were sussing it out, but you kind of get the sense that I don't know if they know what they know. You know it just didn't feel like we, mm -hmm. there was a, a connection mm -hmm. there. So, sorry, I'm just interrupting there because it's, it's bringing back a whole lot of thoughts and, and, no, and, no. and memories, but it's really resonating with me. And I, I, th I suspect it will resonate with some of our, our listeners because it's understanding the, um, the rules, the box, the square, you know, the, the shoe. All right, and then moving to the ha, which is you know, um, now under well, breaking that rule to some extent, so that we we make this more of our own and we connect better. So I'm really liking where we're heading to with that. So so you've got the school, right? You're looking after your school now. They're all disappearing because they they don't like reality. <laughs> they like <it. laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah. They don't like the reality of it. Um, in in um, mm. I, I think for me. Just, just in respect of being a a mm. shihan or a teacher, um, just a bit of background around the Bujinkan, which which now it's called Bujinkan mm -hmm. Kobudo Taijutsu. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. So Bu Bu Warrior Jin God Khan Place Warrior God Training mm -hmm. Hall Bujinkan Dojo um, uh, Kobudo Ko means pre Meiji, 1868. Last samurai was Emperor Meiji. Got rid of the samurai class and then tried to make you know so you could trade better with uh, other countries and that so 1868 so core means pre meiji so all the arts that we practice and there's nine mm. schools in, in the bujinkan um there are um three samurai schools three chinese schools mm. and three ninja schools mm -hmm. so there's nine schools all of those schools go back way before meiji so hence the core budo old arts some people would equate ko budo to uh, like Tadashi Yamashita doing his Kobudo mm. stick fighting and stuff like that with um, you know with some of the sticks, but there are obviously different terms for it. Um, taijutsu, Thai body, Jutsu art, art of the body. Um, so altogether, um, when when I was first introduced to it, it was Warrior Ways of Enlightenment, um, and I suppose um, that sort of takes some of the ninjutsu out of the designation of how mm -hmm. people say they're training now, which is something I sort of really wanted to push here was people say, oh, I'm going to ninjutsu. And it's like, well, there are three ninja schools in Bujinkan. So which one are you doing? Um, to be honest, they, 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 a lot of people don't understand um, what ninjutsu is. Even, dare I say it, some people who train in these arts. From my perspective, from what I've seen, Ninjutsu is, is sort of a higher level than, say, if, if you divide the arts into three mm -hmm. levels. So you've got Budo, lower level, 
Budo is really about distance. If I'm in close, I can hit you, but if I'm in close, you can hit me. So in our early stages, same as tournaments and stuff like that, a lot of people do the Budo. So they're hitting each other, they're getting out of the way, but it's learning, learning about that may I, that distance. Then there's a progression for some people, whereas they realize that we're getting a bit older and you know I can't move as fast. So I need to start applying some sort of tactics and strategies because um, to help win a, a battle or get out of get out of the way. So that's where ninjutsu comes in. So you've got Budo at the lower level, ninjutsu, and then just to cap that off above it, cap with a capstone, um, you've mm -hmm. got uh, Nimpo. And Nimpo is the higher order of ninjutsu. But as far as ninjutsu goes, ninjutsu is about timing and distance. Okay, so you've been fighting for a while and you've been training and you learn that, yes, if I'm in close, but then you start to understand that, say, for example, if someone's coming in with a weapon like a bow or, you know, six foot staff or a sword, that's distance, but mm. it's also time because time is distance. So it might take a second for them to hit you. So you then start learning about timing. So not just distance, but timing. And then you start to understand, well, how can I manipulate their sense of timing? So there are several ways in which you can do it. I, um, if you read the book by uh, mm -hmm. Musashi Miyamoto. Book of Five Rings. Uh, Gordon North Rings, Shore. Yeah. Book of Five Rings. And in there he talks about Sen no Sen, Sen Sen no Sen, Go no Sen. Mm -hmm. I add another one to that, Ku no Sen. But basically... What that means is that you are uh, manipulating mm. someone's sense of timing. And so uh, you're not moving within their rhythm. You might be changing your rhythm. Um, and this is done, one, one of the ways this is done is through understanding uh, the nature of the four elements. Five, actually, ether is the fifth, or the void, ku. So I've, I've brought some props along, <laughs> something I prepared earlier. Mm -hmm. This is called a golden to. So a golden to is... Uh, like a stupa. You see these on headstones or gravestones around Japan. They put them on top of you know people's graves. Not always. They don't always look like this. Um, stupas in Tibet, um, pagodas, they're all based on the four elements or five elements. So you've got mm -hmm. earth, mm -hmm. square, we talked about before. You've got the sphere or the circle, we talked about that before. You've got the triangle, the pyramid, and then you've got the um, mm -hmm. half moon on top. Or you could even, in an alchemist perspective, call that Mm -hmm. um, the crucible underneath the fire. So each of these has a modality, if you like. So essentially, when, when someone starts martial arts, they're normally attracted to a certain modality, which then attracts them to mm. a certain type of martial art. So a martial art where they're, they're more earth-related, it'll be a martial art where they're more holding their ground, not moving a lot. Mm. Say a, a karate form where they're stepping back and just blocking and striking. Someone who's more sort of watery in, the, in their approach is sort of, if you think of it like a wave, they're more attracted to things like I was with Taekwondo, where it's mm -hmm. attack, 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 or defend, defend, counterattack, goes out, comes back in. Someone who's more fire-related would do something like Wing Chun. It's very offensive, controlled aggression, if you like. So they're, they're just moving through. They're eliminating their, their opponent by pulling them from ear to ear. Um, and then you might have the people who are sort of more air-related, the, the circular type stuff, the Aikido, the small circle jujitsu, those sorts of things. But they're, they're, they're sort of not deliberately contacting. They might do Tai Chi, you know, they're just very airy type feelings. So you get these different types of people gravitating towards these different elements um, who gravitate towards these different types of modalities. And that's why I had difficulty because I assimilated so mm. much of Taekwondo because being sort of more water feeling was trying to move out mm. laterally out of the way because I'm so used to going linearly back and then forward. I block, 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 and then I counterattack. Now, um, one of the things that I learned just going back to my introduction to the esoteric school of martial arts was um, the idea behind these elements and how you could use them in everyday life and also how martial arts works in everyday lives. And, and, and I must say, the elements are not just Asian. In magic, you have the elements. In astrology, you have the elements. Uh, a tree won't grow without the elements. You've got to have the earth. You've got to have the water. You've got to have the air, oxygen. You've got to have the metabolism of the fire or the sunlight. Uh, a, everything mm. relies on the elements. Um, internal combustion engine. If you want to troubleshoot what's wrong with it, if it's the block, something's cracked, earth. If it's got a problem with its fuel system, 
or its cooling system, water, if you've got trouble with the spark, fire, or you've got trouble with the air, not enough air getting into it or the air cleaner's blocked. Everything is elemental. So what I learned in this, this introduction also that was mm -hmm. how martial arts work. So Wayne Roy, to his credit, um, was a bit of a scientist, <laughs> I suppose. And one of the principles he came up with was this thing called technique philosophy relationship. That is that your technique, or what, you, what you're um, exuding externally, reflects mm. your internal philosophy. So yeah. body language. So it's like, you know, being aggressive or being evasive or, or um, being assertive. You know, all these things are reflected on the way you think. So body affects mind, mind affects body. So if you've got someone like me who was pretty much in this water mode of block, 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 strike, block, 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 strike, translate that into life. And it's like, this is the way I deal with people out there in the real world because that's what I feel comfortable with. So my boss might push me and push me and push me and hang on a second. And then you come back and it's like, no, no, I'm not putting up with that. Um, or other people who are more fire related, they just walk straight in the office and say, I want a pay rise. You know, and it's like, well, mm, boss ain't going to yeah. like that. Or it might be, I need a volunteer and someone's like, oh, oh, he'll do it, you know, evading or whatever. Or it might be someone mm. who just accepts it, you know. So within, um, within Taijutsu, we have Kamai, which are um, stances, if you like. But they're more than stances. They, nothing in Japanese is simple. So it's not just, oh, this is just a stance. Um, it's actually uh, mm. an attitude or a posture. So say, for example, uh, they're, they're based mm -hmm. on, I don't know whether you can see that. Say, say here, this is a natural sort of thing. It's like, hey, get back, buddy. I've got one in reserve mm -hmm. here, but I'm keeping you back with this. This is Ichimonji no Kamai. So this is the Kamai. So it's reflecting a defensive type of nature. I'm moving back to give myself enough space to gauge what's going to happen next. Same here. This is Doko no Kamai. So I'm pointing at the eyes. I've got this up here, and I'm saying, hey, you want to come this way? Mm. You want mm. a piece of this? You know, so again, you're showing the threat. You could be holding a weapon or whatever. So defensive, it might be that you're attacking. So if you're attacking to move into an attack, you have to protect yourself, but you're moving forward. So in here, you're actually, this is Jumonji. Um, it translates into spiritual uh, senses too, where you're actually protecting yourself, cross of protection, you know, the, the crucifix. I'm warding off evil spirits, so to speak. So you have this sort of idea, but you're moving <coughs> into it um, in a controlled manner. Um, so you have these different postures. You have receiving, come and get me. You have evading, you know, you missed. These sorts of things. So you have these nine postures, if you like. So my natural posture is this one. I want to move back, move back, move back, mm. move back. Counterattack. This is Taekwondo. Move back, move back. So if you start teaching me to move into an attack, it affects my mm. mind as well because I'm now thinking, oh, it's a bit stuck at the first instances. It's like, it doesn't feel very good. But after a while, when you exercise it, interestingly, spiritually, exorcise, exercise, exorcise the demon, the inner demons, you exercise it. After a while, you can do this. So then you start becoming not just this, you start becoming that. And then if you tell people to hold their ground, they start becoming this. And then if you teach people to evade who are naturally always wanting to beat the crap out of people, they become this. So they start becoming all of these elements wow. in balance and in harmony. Yeah. So your internal combustion engine works in harmony with everything. So this was really valuable, this whole idea of technique yep. philosophy relationship. For an example, um, my father had a lot of, to deal with being a, who he was, and he was an alcoholic. And when I was younger and I was doing Taekwondo, he knew that he could push my buttons and I would just take it. I'd keep moving back and out of respect, I wouldn't counterattack. Mm. Yep. Not, you know, metaphorically speaking. So, so then um, after I'd come back from Australia and doing these arts, he, he tried it on me again, but this time I just went straight in, into Jumonji or, or into attacking and sort of obliterated his intent. And he was in tears because he'd never had that before. He thought, oh, yeah, I'll, t I'll take out my frustrations on this guy and he'll just suck it up. And I changed. And, you know, so it was interesting that tra that how that actually transpired. So um, this idea of the elements and, and in real life, the application of these might be, I have you ever had a Kirby <laughs> vacuum cleaner salesman come to your house? Yes, yes. You have. <laughs> Yes, you didn't buy it, did no. you? <laughs> no. You, 
Okay, good, good. So I use the example of the Kirby vacuum cleaner salesman yeah. to express his modalities. Now, what I should say also is that people mm. are always in one of these modalities all the time when they right. are interacting with each other. They're either defending, they're defensive, they're receptive, they're evading, mm. or they're offensive. Defending, attacking, receding, evading. Now, I'll give you an example. The Kirby <laughs> vacuum cleaner salesman opens up the gate, comes down to the front door, knocks on the front door. Hey, sir, I've got this fantastic vacuum cleaner for you. Um, would you like to have a look at it? If you're receiving in earth mode, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. So I'll, I'll buy that. You know, that would be receiving. If you're in a water type mode or where you're retreating back and then come back in like a wave, He'll come to the front door, say, oh, do you want to buy this? Hang on a second. I'll go back, retreat, get my Dyson <laughs> yeah. documentation, yeah. come back and compare it with you. And then you, you'd have this trade-off. It's like, well, this does this and that does that. So you're doing this defensive type of mode. If you're in fire, which is a triangle, if you like, or a pyramid, you're looking out, oh, there's one of those Kirby vacuum cleaner salesmen. You open up the window and you say, get the out of here i don't want that piece of crap and so they're still going through their sales pitch g'day mr oh so you you stop their intent in its tracks okay if you're in evasive mode you see him come in it's like you duck down and you go out the back so he, when he knocks on the door there's no one here <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> so those are the, the four Sorry, modalities yeah. that you can use in life and you can take these modalities um and mm. in your training and transpose those into your life and how you work yes. initially consciously but then after a while they just start happening see my idea of a good martial artist is is pretty much like the body mm. knows what it needs to do so you just let the body know what it but but like a tennis player tennis player practices the forehand practices the backhand you know practices the stance getting there all this sort of thing and then eventually they don't think about i need to hit the ball over to that corner of of the court because he's over here they just tell the body to do it and the body does it so it's like they're up here strategizing and they're telling the body what to do and the body mm. knows what to do it's the same in martial arts so you get to that point of mm. motion no mind where someone comes in and it just happens and you don't you didn't plan it because you can't plan it's not like you can walk down the street and go, well, I'm mm. going to do this when he does that or, you know, because if you had a strategy, nine times out of ten, it would be thwarted. So this whole idea of that that level of, of training, if you like, of, of just automated by, by practicing those different modalities. So then what happens is um, this is based on your intent that where the body wants to do something. So you can assess the situation and go, this guy's drunk and he's he's my drunken brother-in-law. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you must have other brother-in-laws. Um, this is my drunken brother. I doesn't he doesn't drink. Um, and I just need no. to calm him down. So right. I'm only going to use this much force. Whereas this is the guy who's going to get through me and he's going to take some of my family out. I need this much right. intent. And of course, mm. dealing within the bounds of the law. So effectively muscle memory you keep training in these different modalities and they naturally express themselves there were exercises that we do as well where we can bring in those elements and boost them up and balance yourself out as way as well um but sometimes you're watching people training and it's like they want to do this but then they stop and they do something totally different it's like that was naturally would have happened but you just you stopped it you know that this is so, sorry to interrupt you because this is actually really fascinating because you can see this across multiple levels, and I guess what what I'm hearing is that there, uh, for everything we do, there's this the spiritual connection with the physical. I mean, they're, they're interdependent, intertwined. Yes. Um, and the the thing that the thoughts coming to mind is actually two thoughts. One of them is um, there's a book written by um, Pat Riley, who's a basketball. Coach. He used to coach the LA Lakers back in the Magic Johnson times in the '80s and, and so forth. If you follow basketball, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the winner within is what it's called, but he he talks about um, where they train and um, where the skill set becomes instinctive. You know, you, you like you said, you you you, yes. you adapt quite quickly. And um, and and the thought that came to mind when I was when you were just talking there, I have a vivid recollection of, of being um, still in school, but um, right near the end, so perhaps a sixth or seventh former. Uh, in the old money, uh, walking down the street with a group of friends. It was that night time. Not, not that late. It wasn't super late, but it was dark because it was the middle of winter. And uh, 
for some reason, I had the Ghetto Blaster. <laughs> so this is in the 80s, so I had the Ghetto Blaster. It wasn't super loud. It was just, uh, actually, I don't know if it's on the shoulder because I was in, it was a bit heavy. All right. Walking out, and there was there was an ATM, and there was a there was a pickup truck, and there were three guys who were way older and, and bigger because they were they, were, they looked like they're in their twenties, and I have the vivid impression that watch those t- watch those guys, but I didn't. I just ignored it because I'm a young youngin. There's 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 friends around me. We're we're not doing any we're not causing any trouble. We're just going through and and king hit, boom, right on the side here down, All right. and um. Thankfully, it didn't do anything damage other than, oh, that was interesting being knocked out. <laughs> yeah, but, but being mean- able to, um, to, to see that, and I thought, if I was, if I was a little bit older and a, little, a lot more skilled, then I perhaps would have paid a little bit of attention to that situation and perhaps crossed the road right, to avoid that conflict. Right? Because I don't want to get in because I would have been outnumbered or what have you, you know, or they were a lot bigger than me and, and, and all that sort of thing. So I, I guess what I got from what you described there, which is really fascinating to me, is being able to be in tune with not only your surroundings, but you knowing yourself as well. Because that reminded me of another thought, mm-hmm. and I may be way off base here because I'm, I'm not a boxer, but I like watching... David Tua and Mike Tyson fights, and particularly Mike Tyson fights. You know, and mm-hmm. you, know, you can see he, he he's going for the knockout, but he's also very good at evading because his, his peekaboo style and the way he because yes. he will set that up. He will set up, set up, set up because it's not just go out and full on attack, which he can do, but he's very clever about it. So I'm wondering, um, have you seen uh, like different styles of martial arts? Because I put boxing in martial arts because it's it's a fighting thing. That that you pull yeah, from these different places and elements to be able to continually refine your philosophies and thinkings around um, what you do. Um, I, I certainly mm. understand all martial mm. arts, not all, and you know, they'd be a bit egotistical, but I certainly understand mm-hmm. where they all come from and what their strengths and weaknesses mm. are, because you can pick quite quickly. You know, because you know these people gravitate towards it, so you know these people in Wing Chun mm. are going to be fire type people. You know to get out of their way because they're just going to come barreling at you. You know these people over here are doing mm. um, Aikido, so their modality is going to be more of a, an air type feeling of, you know, it's hard <laughs> to catch here. Yeah. It's evasive, like you say. So, you know, and, and, and then defensive, you know, you, their weakness would be that they're moving straight mm. back like I was in TKD to the point where they're overwhelmed because you can move forward faster than they can move back. So that sort of thing. So you, you, you do look at those other arts and their, their line of movement mm. and their power dynamic is another thing. How do they generate the power for this? Is it generated through forearm strength? Is it generated mm. through twisting the body? Is it generated through ligament strength? You know, those sorts of things. So you you sort of look at that. And, and further to that also is as a teacher, um, and, and I must say, um, I don't take mm. that title mm. lightly, especially a teacher in the Bujin Khan. Um, So I'm just going to digress a little bit here because I think it's really some point I wanted to get across. As I said, when I went, when I came back to New Zealand, everyone was a black belt. Everyone wanted to be called sensei in in the sense in Japanese here. Sure. That they had gone further forward, but not much further than most people. Um, But what I look at Mm. these nine traditions that we do, for example, um, Gyokoru, which is the foundation of, of the art that we do, do with school. Um, one of the uh, Chinese, comes back from Chinese origin, came out to Japan at the end of the Tang Dynasty. It's been around for a long time. Some say it goes back even 3,000 years. You've got Togakure-ru Ninjutsu, or Nimpo, um, 1100 AD. Been around for 900 years. Um, all of these schools are very old schools. The reason I can train in these today and go to Japan and, and um, well, before all this COVID debacle, go to go to Japan and train in them is because a lot of people have given their lives mm. on the battlefield to make sure that these arts stayed alive. And so, for example, when you go into the Hombu Dojo in, in Noda in Japan, in Tokyo, or just outside of Tokyo, when Hatsumi Sensei walks in, it's like a thousand warriors uh, walking behind him. Yes. And probably quite rightly so, because they've all died for that cause and those traditions. And, you know, if, if one day I end up, you know, standing at the pearly gates um, and there's a thousand warriors behind saying, you're the guy that turned this place, this this martial arts into a sideshow. Mm. We want to talk to you. You know, I I, I stay true to the t- traditions. 
um, the traditions and the principles. The techniques are not mm. going to help you, but the principles are going to help you within within your life, within martial arts, within within day to day living. Um, so. I see it as a huge responsibility. You you stand up in front of a, a group of people, you make a directive, say you need to do it this way, you're changing their lives. You've got their lives in your hands. And so you can make their life or you can break their life just by your ego is too big or whatever and, and you know, you just want to see someone fall down or or for example, there's a point in martial arts training where you confront the ego and, and the point is at that point it's like I now know I can hurt people and maybe even kill people. Do I take that power and, and not go around killing people, but take that power and let it go to my head? So anyone who walks in the door, I, uh, door, I see them as a challenge or my students and I just beat mm. the living crap out of them all the time. You know, that's where the egos, or you go the other way of the way of compassion and you look at it and you go, well, yes, I can hurt you, but I can also mm. save you or heal you. Yes. So you, that's that point. But some martial artists take it, keep going on that track of, I really want to hurt people. Um, so again, I, I see that as a huge responsibility. One thing that you brought up that that your observation, which I really liked, was we talked about the, the Budo, the Ninjutsu, which is about timing and distance. Mm. The third one is Ninpo. The Ninpo is the higher order of Ninjutsu, which is you led into that quite nicely. I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. Idioms. Got you by the balls, gone for the throat, stabbed you in the back. He's got you by the short and curlies. He's twisted your arm. All those are idioms, you know, and, and we use those day to day. Oh, come down the pub. Can I twist your arm? You know, that sort of thing. Or, or uh, that was pretty brutal. He stabbed her in the back or we stabbed him in the back. Take the idiom. As you said, I everything, this is from my studies in quantum physics as well, uh, which is another area. This is some of the books I've written. Everything that has a form right. has a field around it, called an auric field, called it whatever, source field. And so... An idiom has a field around it. It's a field, essentially, at the, at, in the first instance. So the field is um, someone stabbed you in the back. Well, they haven't stabbed you in the back physically. You might even feel the pain, even though they didn't physically do anything to you. So in training, we learn how to deal with someone who's stabbing you from behind. or We, we, deal, we learn how to deal with someone who's got you in um, mm. twisting your arm or has got you by the throat. And so you take that physical application of practicing how you would get out of it. There's a field around that and you apply that field to that particular instance. So when you're in a business meeting and they they've got you by the throat, Oh, I know how to deal with this. Not even consciously. I've done with this in the dojo, throw the field at it and it comes out in verbal terms. For me, there's no difference between a physical punch, a verbal uh, abuse or a verbal attack and a spiritual attack. They're all just different intensities of the same vibration, just mm. higher frequencies, if you like. So dealing with these idioms. Now, I'll give me an example. Um, friend, oh, one of my black belts down in Wellington, uh, he was running a self-defense mm -hmm. class for women <clears throat> at BP New Zealand. And he said, why don't you come along? You're down, you come along and see what we're doing. So it's the fourth night, I think it was. And anyway, these women, I walked in there and in the middle of the class and, and they were sort of mucking around a bit, you know, and just joking with each other and weren't really getting into it. And he took me aside and he says, they're not getting it. I said, what do you mean they're not getting it? He said, how many, how many sessions you done? He said, oh, this is the fourth, but they're, they're not, they're not getting it. I said, what, what are they supposed to get? I said, how long have you been training? Oh, he'd been training eight years or something. And he said, oh, eight, eight years. I said, when did you think that you would become effective in defending yourself out in the street physically? probably four or five years ago or four or five years into my training. I said, and you expect these people who've been training for three nights yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to be able to defend themselves. I said, what you're trying to do here is build up a field of confidence. Or I didn't use it that way, but what I was saying is give them an air of confidence. You know how sometimes you go around people and it's like, especially some of those um, mm -hmm. SF guys, you know, that mm. they've got that air of confidence about them. They're quiet, they're unassuming, but you wouldn't want to mess with them. So I said, the best that you can do is give them enough confidence, not overconfidence, that when that girl walks out in the street and someone looks to go and attack her and she's walking in a sort, certain sort of fashion, like a ghetto <laughs> blaster. Or... Like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that. Dump, dump, dump. So loud that you can't hear someone walk up behind you. But um, then that person's going to look at them and go, oh, no, yeah. there's something about that person. They sense that. 
in Ninpo, it goes that step further. So you might be sitting in a bus and you get this thought comes in or from out of left field that's like, when you get off the bus, there's a guy who's going to attack you. And it's like, okay, well, if he if he punches me or if he stabs me with a knife, I'll move this way and I'll do this because I've done it in the dojo so I know that I can make it work. So you send that back. Balance, equilibrium, it cancels it out. The guy is sitting there thinking, I'm going to do this. Next thing is knife falls down. Yeah, really? oh. <laughs> Doesn't know why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be attacking yeah. anyone tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's that's what we call it, mm. sort of astral combat, if you like. <clears throat> so you're you're projecting that um, field, if you like. Um, so yeah, so um, that's how martial arts works at the higher levels. Is I, I've never had a real fight in martial arts. I've been doing martial arts for. 47 years I've always got out of getting getting into situations you know so um, for example ninjutsu I mean this, this is another misnomer Hatsumi sensei says that ninjutsu is about uh, escaping and hiding it's not about fighting you know so um, the whole idea of someone showing you mm. a fighting technique and, and I'll explain the idea of ninjutsu yeah keep going Let's keep can going. we keep going no no, no uh, it's fine I know you were trying this, this this is the ideogram for nin, just to say how what ninjutsu is about. So the top part of this uh, is mm. blade, okay? So And the bottom underneath here is heart. So you've got the blade over the heart, okay? Now, what that actually means is that if you think of a blade... One moment. Ooh, something <laughs> I prepared earlier. Just won't get tangled up. This, mm-hmm. is, this is a live blade. So it, it's razor sharp. It's called a shinken. If I drop this on somebody, it doesn't it doesn't uh, discriminate. If I just drop it rather than actually control it and cut down on it, it'll cut anyone in its way. It'll cut me. It'll cut you. It'll cut whoever. This is truth, if you like. It's it's a symbol of truth. So that's the blade in the metaphoric sense mm. over the heart. So being aware that as a ninja. You have this blade sitting over your heart. If you err, if you err, the blade will come down and cut the heart. So you, you're taking personal response, you, you know, mm. uh, cause and effect, Newton's third law, whatever you want to call it, um, that karma, a law of interference, you do something to someone, it'll come back at you. Your responsibility. <coughs> if it does and hurts your heart, um, take responsibility for it. Something bad happens to you. It's because you've done something somewhere you've been caused pain um, because mm. you've caused pain somewhere. So this is this, this is really what makes a ninja. And this is interesting because I was saying to Joe when I was talking to him earlier, um, people would say, oh, this guy thinks he's a ninja, you know. It's like, well, what you think a ninja is and what I think a ninja is is obviously two different things if you don't think that I could say that I am a ninja. Because it's not all that glossy, you know, I'll do a backflip, yeah. climb up that wall, you know prove that you're a ninja show me disappearing you know or whatever it's really about that idea of taking responsibility for your actions and knowing that when the heart gets cut metaphorically speaking your heart gets hurt it's because you you've done something to cause that through cause and effect so living that philosophy of of not blaming other people for something that happens to you because we Mm. live in a blame society you know oh he did this and they did that and he did this you know even if you have Someone bangs into your car. The way I see it, it's 50-50. That person needed to learn something. You needed to learn something. So in a sense, you should be thanking them for bringing that karma to the fore so that you can get wow. on with life. That, you know? Yep. You go. Once sorry. you've... Yep. Sorry, I was just going to say, just once you've yeah. accepted that mm. the blade is over the heart, and I, mm-hmm. I'm a Freemason as well, right? So I don't know what you know about Freemasonry, but this whole mm-hmm. thing of the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill and its conspiracy theory and the Illuminati are taking us over and all that sort of thing. That that mm. there is, is God. God is truth. There's no religion higher than truth. That's right. the blade on the heart. So that is God's judgment. So in the all-seeing eye of Freemasonry, it's about God is always watching everything that you do. And God will punish you if you do anything right. Now, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, so um, I'm not going to go down that track. But mm. if you get that idea. So... A ninja lives by that philosophy. Once the ninja understands that, they then, it's a good heart wielding the blade to help others. So as a teacher, 
I'm cutting away at the crap of other people. I don't want to be students' friends. I don't, that's not my role. My role is to help them to ascend. So spiritually. So that's, that's, that that's is absolutely nice, fascinating because, you know, part of me was thinking when we were coming on to this conversation that, um, um, we we're going to talk about fighting techniques. We we're going to talk about the squares, right? And yeah, and um, how you would throw the smoke bombs, and um, the shurikens will come out, and the darts, and all those sort of things. Which are the? I oh, think you even got one. <laughs> and yes, I used to make those in metalwork and intermediate back in the day. Um, we all did, and then we would throw it at each other because yeah, you can. Just yeah, yeah, <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> Dan, they can throw they them, can back. Throw them yeah. back. I do remember a a, a star we had cut out in middle work sticking in someone's leg in the bus line. Um, yeah. Anyway, no Ooh. one complained, so, yeah, good times. <laughs> but, oh, gee. What? So what, what, was, yep. what really is standing out to me is the philosophy that underpins everything. So it, it's really clear that for those that are looking to undertake, say, or resonating or connecting with some sort of martial art, whether it's um, <clears throat> whether it's let's take it um, and, and keep it close to home, whether it's, it's learning the um, maraku or, or taiha, you learn taiha or or, um, um, or patu, or, um, or if we go out and we use um, other weapons, or if we go into the, to the military and use firearms, you know, we can learn the techniques. But what are the things behind it, the philosophies that make us really connect with what we're doing, so we become one with our weapons, whether it's our, our fists, our feet, our head, whatever, our body, or the extensions of those. But that applies to everything. And this is what I'm getting. Yeah, it's yes, sports. It does. Um, it's life. And, I it's mean, life. you can see it with, um, uh, well, we, we'll keep it very Kiwi. Let's say say rugby, right? And you see the um, the the – you've got really good All Blacks and then you've got great All Blacks. All right. and, and no disrespect to anyone that's worn the jersey because the, the journey to get there has just been phenomenal. But those that have transit, like Richie McCaw or Dan mm. Carter or Ma'anonu, Conrad, those, Jonah Lomu, you know, those type of um, echelon of players, there was just something else. There was just this one other thing. But the, if you dig behind a little bit deeper, like uh, Richie McCaw, you, know, you, you hear the story behind it where he writes down his goals for, pre-match, but he wrote down as part of his goal to become an All Black was Gab, great All Black. He wants to be a, a, not just an All Black, but a great All Black. But to do that is the underpinning philosophy behind mm -hmm. the techniques that he would utilize on the rugby field. So this is really connecting with me because, you know, I, like yourself, Stuart, um, I work in, in the IT space. Um, I, I work a lot across teams, um, working with teams and helping others become a little bit a little bit better than perhaps where they are in, in the, as, a, as a teacher. Um, but to be able to teach effectively mm -hmm. is to be able to help people connect their philosophy to just the stuff that they do. Right? The, we can teach a practice, yes. whatever it is, but why are they doing that? that otherwise, it doesn't make sense. If you enjoyed this conversation, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media. Be sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be kept up to date with more inspiring messages from amazing New Zealanders each and every week. If you found this discussion helpful, we invite you to share this link with your networks and tag Brian and I when you do. We would love to hear from you, so please be sure to leave us a review so that we can continually strive to provide the best service possible. As Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict your future is to create it. We thank you for your support, Aotearoa, and we're excited to partner with you in working together to create a better future. Let's go.